everyone. This is Don Keelan, and welcome to uh, Q&A Live. Today, I'm doing the uh, interview with uh, 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 Joe Benning from Linden, Vermont. Welcome, Joe, to the uh, uh, program. Thanks, Don. Uh, Joe is a, uh, a Vermont state senator and has been for 12 years uh, from up, upstate, and he is the uh, candidate for the position of lieutenant governor. Uh, Joe is a graduate of uh, Linden State College and also of the Vermont Law School. And if I'm not mistaken, you've been practicing law for about four decades almost. No, I like to tell people I actually am not practicing anymore. I've learned how to do it. You are running for the position of lieutenant governor. Can you share with our audience what is the role of the lieutenant governor? There are three formal functions of the office itself. The first is that you are literally the person gaveling the Senate in and out every day. You're running that organization like you would a town meeting. Uh, I've actually been the town moderator in the town of Linden for 10 years, so I know how to get a group of people through a calendar and make sure that the business is conducted fairly and appropriately. That, um, banging of the gavel, if you will, you have to develop a certain rhythm and cadence to what you are doing in order to make sure that the process runs smoothly. You also have to have a working knowledge of what the rules of the Senate are. Um, there is a process that you go through to make sure when you're doing your business on a day-to-day -day basis that you understand what the entire, um, I'll guess, how to describe it, what you do on a daily basis is a business and you have to get that business conducted uh, and you're the person in charge of making sure that it does. The second component of the office is you are one of a committee of three people who is uh, collectively known as the Committee on Committees. Sounds kind of silly, but the Committee on Committees literally appoints every senator to their respective committee roles as well as the chairs of each one of those committees. I've been there 12 years now. I know who all the players are. I think I know how they work together and after COVID, how some of them don't work together. Um, but knowing those players is important when you're making designations to each committee. And then finally, if you are um, in the unfortunate position, which you and I have both uh, experienced once in our lifetime, where the governor in power suddenly is unable to function in that role anymore, uh, you step up to the plate to take over the governor's role. If you're doing these other roles, how do you know what the governor is doing? what's going on in the administration other than what's going on in the legislature? Well, the first part is you have to, in my case anyway, if I'm part of the governor's party, uh, I am working with his administrative team on a regular basis. Having served as Senate Minority Leader and now as the chair of the Senate Institutions Committee, literally his staff comes into our committee room, has conversation with us on a daily basis. We understand the projects that the governor has put forth. Uh, we try to figure out a way to make sure they get shepherded through the building. And the delivery of that through the legislature becomes our responsibility. So I've been working with his administrative team for 12 years. I've also worked with his campaign team having traveled around the state with him uh, campaigning on several of his campaigns. And so in my case, uh, I feel as if I am ready to step into that role with the team that he has assembled in order to keep the business of government moving forward. The distinction I have between myself and my opponent is um, he has pretty much alienated himself from the governor. They did not get along when the um, role of lieutenant governor was being uh, served by David Zuckerman. They had a relationship that was quite strained and on the most recent primary night, uh, David made the mistake of announcing to his audience that he was going back to Montpelier to get that hump out of the way, that hump meaning Phil Scott. So right away there's some antagonism there and the team that Phil Scott has assembled uh, and by the way, I have no misconception. I believe Phil Scott's going to get reelected. But the team that he has assembled to run this $8.2 billion entity known as the state of Vermont, uh, you've got to have those folks in your camp if you're going to be taking over that role. And I think that's probably one of the strongest distinctions between David and myself. We don't have sufficient employees in this state to carry out the role of so many organizations, whether regardless of the sector. What is the legislature doing about this? Uh, we have, as a group, coming through COVID, recognized all of these problems. 
But there's only so much that a legislature can do with the money that it has available to try to entice people here. From my perspective, the lieutenant governor's position is a golden opportunity to become a salesperson for the state of Vermont. The same thing can be said about our college systems here, our prison systems here, our mental health facilities here. And by the way, those latter two are much more of a concern than somebody not being able to open a restaurant. When you have the corrections department saying, all of you corrections officers who are here are going to go to a 12-hour shift. That's really problematic. I mean, this is our basic safety we're talking about. So it's, you may not be able to find a restaurant open, but in comparison, that just pales to the fact that our prison system is in that much trouble. So what can be done about it from a legislative perspective? You can enact laws, but that doesn't bring people here. You can entice people with certain legislation, which the governor has tried to do with a program where you would offer out-of-state folks a sum of money to come here and work remotely if they have that opportunity. Um, but the thing for a lieutenant governor, I think this is really important, they have the time and the proper person in that role becomes a salesperson for the state of Vermont. And my intent in taking over that role, not just the three basic functions of the role, but creating a situation where I become the salesperson for Vermont. I will travel anywhere on the globe to try to entice people to come here. And I'll use as an example Kyle Clark and his family. Kyle is the actual CEO of Beta Technologies, which presently is in Burlington with several hundred workers, but he wants to expand. So last Saturday, I had him at the Caledonia County Airport giving him a spiel about how great Caledonia County is. Could he expand his business there? That's the classic thing that I would love to do in this position. Try to bring people who are up and coming, they have ideas on how to help the state economically, get them here, let them tour around, take them by the hand, if you will, and give them a tour of our state house, one of my favorite things to do, uh, and present to them the Vermont image and the Vermont brand that might entice them to come here. All right, and now we get to another uh, issue that's uh, impacting the ability, and that is the lack of housing. With the interest rates doubled what they were last year, M many young people cannot afford the down payment. Can I, can I have you uh, there's give a, me a little bit of... Uh, sure, there's a lot to unpack there, but let me start with one thing I recommend to young people today. If you're going to come to, for instance, Manchester and try to find a house, you're probably going to be in trouble because most of the houses are, are taken or they are far beyond your financial ability to pay for. That doesn't mean the same situation is over in Peru, for instance. And I'm going to use my daughter as a classic example. My daughter is a paramedic in Stowe. There's no possible way she could afford any piece of property in Stowe. But she learned just outside of Stowe, in the tiny town of Walcott, there were some reasonably priced homes. And she recently purchased her first home. I encourage young people to look farther beyond the geographical boundaries of the place they want to work in order to find affordable housing. Because I still think it does exist. If you look hard enough, you should be able to find something. The second part of your uh, discussion there is whether we have an impediment to new housing being built. I think we do. We have had problems with contractors finding laborers. We've had problems when they do find laborers getting the supply chain moving because everything is on back order. We have, as a legislature, made moves to try to correct all that. Um, recently, we've had, let's see, my notes um, indicate $90 million of ARPA money was taken and, and devoted to this very cause. Recently, Phil Scott had a ribbon cutting ceremony up in Lamoille County for a new set of affordable housing. There is another uh, planned ribbon cutting down in this neck of the woods, I think tomorrow, um, about Phil Scott coming and saying, look, we've got this money designated. We want to start this example of saying the money is there. We need the contractors who are available. We need the red tape to enable those contractors to build housing. So we're trying to battle this on several different fronts. And I think eventually um, we're going to get to a point where people are going to smooth out. And where we find the workers to come in the first place, I think that would be my job as lieutenant governor to try to get out there and find them. The addiction issue in Vermont, and I know you're uh, this is really uh, close to you, and you're, uh, 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 you, you have some ideas on how 
we, we can we can uh, maybe reverse this because right now it's a according to the governor according to the, uh, the previous governor uh, it was a, it's been a major issue yeah i was actually sitting in the general assembly's main hall the house of representatives when peter shumlin gave us a state of the state speech that was solely devoted to That's this issue to. And I, I was surprised on one hand to hear the length of that conversation, but on the other hand, I knew even though he was a Democrat and I was a Republican, he was exactly right. This is an issue that has been uh, on my radar screen as a criminal defense attorney for 40 years. Uh, as being able to look over time and say, this has gotten way out of hand. Government hasn't responded in the way that it should, and what are we going to do about it? So we've been looking, I serve on the Judiciary Committee as well, and the Judiciary Committee has been taking hours and hours of testimony on this very subject, trying to figure out what the best way to approach the entire subject is. From soup to nuts, uh, soup being the initial consumer, how do you address the consumer? What do you do to convince people that this is not a good path to walk down? The soup to nuts part, the nut part being, what do you do with those people who are fostering this problem? How do you interdict those people who are coming from out of state? Uh, we have corridors in this state that are literally drug runs. And you have a law enforcement problem and an image that has been created now in Vermont that we want to defund the police. I'm somewhat rambling here, but the upshot is you've got a whole bunch of different angles to look at this problem from, and every angle has to be looked at very thoroughly. Uh, so there's no one magic component in that series that's going to cure the problem. You've got to tackle it all the way around. I use one other example. Uh, way up in the town of Johnson, Greg Tatro and his family lost a daughter to an overdose. They have used that horrible experience um, and the money that the Tetro family happened to have to turn that whole nightmare around in a positive way. They are running an entity called Jenna's Promise. They have the ability to provide wraparound services to people who are suffering from opioid addiction. They have not only wraparound services that would cover their medical situation, but they are bringing in outside entities to provide housing. They are working literally on a store that they have these folks who have come out of addiction working at the store to try to maintain it on its own. But for the cost of about $12,000 per person, they are adequately addressing the opioid addiction problem of each of those individuals. Whereas, I'm chair of the Senate Institutions Committee. I know we spend approximately $80,000 a year on a woman at the Chittenden County Correctional Facility. Which direction should we be going? The Chittenden County Correctional Facility, I applaud the people who work there. I'm not trying to disparage them, but quite frankly, a woman housed there is not going to get the same kind of wraparound services and attention that they need in order to get off the products that they were addicted to. Why don't we have a hub here in, in uh, Bennington County? We were promised one several years ago. There was a big fanfare in Bennington. Your colleague, Senator Sears, was part of it. Brian Camping was part of it. Uh, but it never materialized. Uh, and yet we have the highest rate per capita of, of uh, uh, overdose deaths, I believe, in the state, yeah. right here in Bennington County. Um, and, and would you uh, push for that or help us I would, get elected? I would push for every county in this state to replicate Jenna's promise uh -huh. because it offers a more intelligent approach to this entire subject. I know that uh, when Peter Shumlin was governor, they came out with this hub and spoke model that was designed for mental health situations and also to some extent for opioids. But it never materialized the way it was anticipated because there just wasn't enough money to do it. Now you have a program that is once established, almost able to maintain itself. And that's a totally different idea from what we were looking at when Peter Shumlin was governor. Another area that you, you folks up in the Senate are taking up and, and the legislature take up a lot, a lot of time on is climate change. And uh, the governor just announced recently that uh, uh, Vermont may ban uh, all new fossil fuel car operated cars in 2035. Why would you make a statement such as that 
without a proven uh, uh, record that EVs, electric vehicles, will work. The same thing with the clean heat standard. Why wasn't there a model created to see if a town could, uh, uh, what, what would be the implication of imp imp uh, implementing that act? And here's the model, and, and take one of our towns down here. Uh, I'm giving you a lot to digest. Uh, you're giving me a lot to digest, but I, I can tell you, I could come back and do another hour and a half on this show to talk about this very subject. First off, people have to remember the legislature some years ago decided that we were going to adapt and attach ourselves to California emission standards and desires. Why? Probably because it was the most progressive in the state about trying to advance the cause of getting to renewable energy, which I happen to be in agreement with. But doing it the right way is where we've suddenly found ourselves at a crossroads. Um, I'm going to disagree with the governor to this extent. I don't think we should be attached to the California standards. There are another set of standards called the federal emissions standards, which are slightly lower but still moving in the same direction. I think we should be attached to the federal standards. But I'm in the minority party. My minority caucus has argued for this for some time. We can't be successful in getting that argument through if we're in the minority party. The problem that I see from trying to attach ourselves to California is California has the power to say to companies like Ford, General Motors, Toyota, you cannot sell vehicles here that are gas powered anymore. Vermont doesn't have that power. I mean, if we try to exercise that power, we become subject to the economic realities around us. New Hampshire would see a golden business opportunity at that point, and they do. Every time Vermont moves in a direction like this, uh, I repeatedly get uh, messages from legislators in New Hampshire saying, thanks for this opportunity again, New Hampshire's going to benefit. Um, Vermont has 640,000 people roughly in its population. If the entire population was to disappear tomorrow, our collective carbon output would obviously disappear. The problem is it would have absolutely no impact on climate change whatsoever. So are we making a smart move there? There are things we should be doing, for instance, trying to weatherize homes, make sure the population is resilient as the climate changes. But to try to take the lead on developing reactions to climate change in the way that is now proposed in this very subject uh, for me is very problematic because you're going to cause a lot of economic hardship for people who don't want to have a negative impact pact on climate change, but they know they won't anyway, even if they disappeared tomorrow. So use intelligent tools trying to move forward. You mentioned uh, the 640,000, if they disappeared, we, we obviously the, uh, the, the carbon emissions issue would disappear. Not for Vermont only. Yeah, for Vermont. Yeah. Not necessarily. I, uh, I've always been arguing the case. Vermont, uh, the carbon emissions from transportation is 48%. I think uh, he, uh, home heating is about 20% and so forth. Farming, is, I think, is about 12 to 18, yep. 16%. Mm -hmm. I, uh, so that 48%, so, so you get rid of all the, uh, uh, the 640,000. We have 13 million visitors that come to Vermont each year. Right? With SUVs and what have you. Of course. And they go from, uh, they come in down in Pownall or they come in through Brattleboro uh, and they go all the way up to Stowe and up to where you are, to Jay Peak and what have you. Uh, they, are, they are doing quite a bit of uh, pollution, if you will. Sure. Right? Uh, there are many places uh, in the country where you have tourism, you cannot drive a car. Now, are you willing to say, look, if we want to really go after the co uh, pollution issue with on transportation, all right? You come into the state, you have a, a right at the border, you get, you get onto our electric bus, and we'll take you to Jay Peak, or we'll take you to Stowe. It's impractical, I know that. But what I'm saying is, the, uh, uh, are, are we really addressing the issue? No, no of course no, not. No, we're not, okay. And, and let me just quickly and, say, this should be a national conversation not a state conversation yes. for the very reason you're describing. Yes. If we say as Vermonters, we are not going to sell gas-powered cars here, 
Well, that means that all these mom and pop convenience stores that have a gas pump out front, they're going to disappear because there's no reason for them to be here when the tourists are not around. You got a whole lot of automobile dealerships and repair shops that are going to disappear. This is a substantial part of our economic engine we're talking about. They're going to disappear because there's no reason for them to be here. I know, can, let me stop you there, Joe, for sure. a minute, because that was another uh, another question. Uh, let's just take Manchester. All right, half the town now. Uh, uh, this is going out in the future. Half the town has electric vehicles. Yeah. All right, the other half are still using fossil. Right. The fossil gas, the fossil fuel stations, the fossil fuel uh, delivery, uh, oil delivery companies are saying, we're not investing any more money in this business because it's fossil fuels. What happens when we don't have any more gas stations, but yet half the people still have a car? <laughs> and what happens uh, when half the homes are still operating with uh, gas or uh, oil? oil sure. And we have no fuel dealers. Well, the easy answer is you don't heat your home unless you transform it to some other form of energy supply, and your cars will eventually rot in your backyard. But the point is, while, I, while, while that's happening, I still need gas for that car. I still need fuel for that home. Where do I get it if my fuel dealer is no longer in business? I know where I'm going to get it. It's 18 miles across the Connecticut River in New Hampshire. Okay. Well, you can, and you can and I can do that because I'm that close to the border, but the bulk of this state yeah. can see where I'm coming from. Oh, absolutely. I, uh, think, I think we I, have I a think basic agreement. I think the legislature, agreement. when I saw the clean heat standard leg legislation and so forth, I didn't see you addressing the practical side of all of this. And, uh, and I know for you know, a fact from listening to the uh, utility people, there's no way in Arlington that if the whole town went electric tomorrow that yeah. the grid system can handle it. So let me, let me back you up because you just made a comment about whether I have ever addressed it. We had major arguments on the Senate floor when the clean heat standards were being discussed initially. And I repeatedly stood on the floor and said, look, we all know the lowest hanging fruit on trying to reach what were goals and are now mandate, mandates for carbon emission reductions, the lowest hanging fruit to cure that problem is your transportation fleet and your home heating costs. Those are the only two things you can react to to have any chance at getting to those mandates. And we repeatedly said that, hoping that they would back off of this. We're in the minority party. We lost that argument. So here we are. Let's move over to the health care uh, system just for a minute and get your, uh, your, your opinions on a couple of things. Do you think the, the, the way the health care is delivered in Vermont today is sustainable? given the uh, rise in costs, uh, and if not, what would you do? Well, to answer your first question, no, it's not sustainable. And in fact, when Al Gobey took over the Green Mountain Care Board, we had a meeting with him, and he, he looked around at, at the Republican caucus and said, you know, guys, if we were to start all of this from scratch, we would never end up with what we've got right now. So the conversation uh, went from there to what can Vermont do as a state? We were in the midst of um, all kinds of discussions about trying to take on health care as a state entity. And we knew as Republicans that you just could not sustain that either. So in my own mind, I said, this is a national conversation. We shouldn't be trying to bite this on our own. Um, it led to Peter Shumlin having as one of his grand schemes, health care for all. We knew the resources were not there to sustain it. We knew that doctors could use their feet to go elsewhere because they weren't going to be on the state's salary and accept what they'd have to be paid for to deliver those services. So bringing all of those problems to light, um, eventually Peter Shumlin got the message and he yanked his own biggest program proposal. Uh, I am appalled, frankly, because two days or three days ago we had a debate in Tunbridge, myself and Mr. Zuckerman, and he said he wants to bring that conversation back to the table. Um, that's not a step forward. That's a step backward. We lost over $200 million trying to get to where Peter Shumlin wanted to be. And even he, at the last moment, realized it wasn't going to be sustainable. But what was interesting about that, I might interject, and goes back to the working on the energy issue, they did a model. And the model proved that that wouldn't work. You know, universal health care would not work in the state. They paid a lot of money for it. Yes, well over $200 million. It was a lot of money we lost in that uh, project. And uh, 
and, and but they did a model before they instituted uh, uh, create a whole law. <clears throat> the model proved this wasn't going to work. Right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and another uh, issue that's uh, in, in, the, in the forefront uh, is the issue of policing in Vermont. Right now, we have we have the issue of uh, the, the the lack of staffing. Some towns are saying to fund the police. Some towns are saying fund the police. We have a a, a very serious morale issue, uh, and uh, and and now I see that the uh, uh, you may be taking up again the issue of qualified immunity. Do you think there's an issue with policing in Vermont and, uh, and with our police uh, organizations? Sure. I, first off, the police organizations are taking all the heat for the problems that are happening elsewhere in the world. I'm not going to say Vermont doesn't have its own problems, but they don't rise to the level of a George Floyd situation. We have police officers that need training. We have instituted programs for their training to incorporate concerns that the public at large have about how police interact with citizens. And I think we're on a great track with that. The police agencies in this state have been very wonderful about collecting data that they uh, have on a daily basis, using that data to create training programs to help people uh, who are recruits understand what they can and cannot do. And so from my perspective, we've got to stop as a society saying police are all bad. You've got to get out of that habit. What's going on in Burlington right now is terrible. When you have uh, citizens who are saying defund the police and then you watch the rise in crime. Uh, I don't know about you and when the last time was you were in Burlington, I'm literally getting concern for my safety when I go into that city now. Uh, there are just too many things happening and they've lost a substantial portion of that police force. What issue would you work on if you could only work on one issue? I think the most available issue for me to work on is literally selling Vermont. I have to become the salesperson for Vermont around the world if necessary. It addresses numerous concerns that we've talked about here this morning. Who is out there being the champion of the Vermont brand, Vermonters, their work ethic, their products? What can we do to sell to prospective Vermonters the idea that this is a great place to live, work, and play? Um, I think a lot of people are attracted to this state for various reasons and it would be on my shoulders to get out there, meet them and try to promote them to actually go through the process of moving here. Um, so that would be my hope in using the office beyond those three core principles that it has to function in, um, getting to the point where you're literally the state's chief salesperson. If uh, people want to find more about Joe Benning, uh, how would they do that? It's real easy. Go to joebenning.com. Can't be any easier than that. Thank you all for being with me today. And Joe, thank you very much and uh, all the best. Thanks for and having thanks me. Thanks for Don. coming down here from Linden, Vermont. Wonderful trip. All of you have a great day.